realize we have a finite amount of resources and we have finite staff and finite attention, frankly, to spend in the cyberspace make sure you're dealing with the problems that that can impact you so that that's what they call threat analysis hi there i'm charlie your online business manager my goal is to assist small to medium business owners build their businesses with a focus on using the internet and online technologies in an appropriate and cost-effective manner people hire me to take the stress out of managing their businesses and allow themselves to focus on what they do best Today, I'm going to talk about security and IT security and all the things that small businesses need to think about, which I'm really, really excited about. And my guest is Terry Zemniak, who's got over 25 years experience in the information security field and has worked uh, from technical compliance and executive leadership. I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, looking forward to the conversation too. Fantastic. Look, Terry, I've given people a bit of an overview of who you are. Why don't you give us a little bit more of a helicopter Thanks. view about who you are, how you came to be here, uh, and you know, why why I, IT? Why why IT security? <laughs> well, so my career kind of breaks down in a, in a three phases, Charlie. Uh, the, the the first phase right out of school, some twenty years ago or so very technical bits and bytes. So I got out of college with a computer science degree, which is programming. So um, I was writing codes, working on databases, doing network stuff. And basically I was pretty good at everything back in the old days. Um, wasn't great at anything, but pretty good at a lot of stuff. And back in the old days, that's what you needed to be a, a, a good security practitioner. As engineers, you need to be good at a whole lot of stuff, but not necessarily focused on any one. So, uh, security opened up to me and I, that opportunity and I, I, I certainly enjoyed it. It was interesting. It was challenging, all sorts of cool things. So they were paying me to break into companies, uh, white hat hacking, so we're authorized, but breaking into companies, working for some government groups here in the U.S., uh, architecting big, cool technical security solutions. Um, so the first phase is real technical part of my career. Second phase then is, is where I went into compliance and then leadership as well. So in the U.S. here, uh, we had some clients asking us about some regulations um, and really none of the techie guys knew anything about the regulations because we were just bits and bytes. But the business people were starting to come to us saying, hey, not worried about bits and bytes. I'm worried about satisfying the regulations. And, and that's where we kind of pivoted my career. Well, I'll, I'll look at it. I'll become the security regulation guy. So I uh, did that, pivoted to that. And uh, in the U.S., because of, well, maybe a little bit because I'm good, but maybe a little bit because there was a vacuum of leadership. It allowed me to kind of rock it up to the org chart in, in the U.S. healthcare system. So I've got about a decade of experience as what they call the chief information security, really large healthcare systems across the U.S. So that second phase is really in the executive part of cyber. And now my current phase, hopefully the not phase, not the last phase, but my current phase uh, I, I'm consulting. So I, with, with my experience at, in the business executive side and my business on the technical side, now I'm taking that to small, mid-sized businesses and I work, work as what's fractional cybersecurity. So uh, a growing trend in the U.S. and I think across the world is the idea of part-time executives that will work for you. Uh, there's fractional CFOs and fractional CTOs. I'm a fractional cybersecurity guy. And what that means is maybe one day a week or, or, or half a day a week, I'm your executive. I'll work on roadmap and strategy and execute and interface with, with clients. Basically do what you'd expect for an executive, but just in a much smaller slice. Well, that's very, very similar to what I do in terms of um, IT for, for other organizations as well. So you're in good company. Um, and I know a lot of my audience uh, understand how that works because that's how they work. We do, we, we all contract to other businesses or a lot of us contract to other businesses. and provide services that way so that sounds fa fascinating i do love that you sort of said you're a generalist not a specialist and that's what you needed to be for security absolutely um it's and it's a bit different now i think but yeah back in the wild the, the early days the wild wild west of the I, um it industry so why don't we have a chat about what it is you're seeing with small businesses and the sorts of things that um you think that they need to be considering what what is it that what, what does IT security mean to a small business? Why don't we start there? 
Yeah, well, uh, we'll start with IT security, but maybe I'd, I'd throw in right off the bat, this is a need to think about a lot more than just IT security. So there's a technical part of security, but there's also people and process and regulations, and I, I'm sure we'll get to all that. On the technical side, what I'm seeing for small businesses is, for good or bad, most of these businesses outsource their IT services. So if you have a really small shop, you're not gonna have a full-time IT person to do desktop servers, remote access, email, that sorts of stuff. And with that, the leadership believes that the security responsibility is pushed down to the IT service provider. And generally there's a disconnect. So your IT service provider is there to call if you have a problem with your email, but IT provider may not be looking for attacks in your emails and may not be looking to verify your email securities are at the level you need to be at or verify your laptops are properly encrypted. So. Um, you know, I, I think we're one part that I see missing for these small businesses is a mutual understanding of, hey, I, IT company, I want you to do the IT stuff for me. I expect you to implement the right cybersecurity controls. And, and, and there, there's often a big disconnect where people aren't asking the right questions. There's assumptions, whatever it may be. I, I see that as a big disconnect for the small companies. Now, I, I, I agree entirely, uh, and I think a lot of that is because they don't understand what they need either, and no one's actually talking to them about what they need. Uh, they see things come through their email, they see them on the internet, oh, so-and-so got hacked again. Oh, well, that doesn't affect us because we're not using it that. But what they don't understand is that's actually endemic in the stack of information, the stack of tools they're using. That's a very base level of their tools they're using, but they don't understand where that, that fits into them. And they need someone to say, no, you need that to be patched. You need that to be fixed. You need that to be in place. Um, now, you actually picked me on it, and I'm really grateful that you did. When I was talking about IT security, you said there's so much more than just IT security. So why don't we go back to that? Because it doesn't matter how good your virus scanning is. It doesn't matter whether you've got a password manager in place. It, it, none of that would matter if you don't have several other things in place as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think a great way to cover this conversation, Charlie, is is to have an example I think most people are familiar with, the idea of email phishing. So what phishing is, is someone will send you an email, tend to be someone you know, and based on that email, they'll try to get you to do something they want you to do. So, you know, maybe they ask you to click on a link, open an attachment, reset a password, or whatever it may be. Um, but it's extremely common cyber attack, especially for small businesses. So. Basically, we're dealing with a, a fake email asking you to do something. Technology doesn't really solve that problem. Technology can help, but all the filters in the world are not going to be 100% successful. So a cer certain amount of these bad emails are going to make it through. So your technology is not going to be your fear in this case. So that opens up what else do we have. When you talk cybersecurity controls, Charlie, and you're well aware of this, I'm sure. It's people, it's process, and it's technology. So the technology, in the example of phishing email, you're going to have email filters running, which is great. And you can get email questions in your exchange or your mail or email, whatever your mail may be. You get technical protections to help you. But if if 1% or, you know, one-tenth of 1% make it through, now the question is the person, Terry, the person, Charlie, is Terry going to click on it? Is, is Charlie going to open it and say, oh, I this email is from a client and I'm going to do something they asked me to do. So you got a part of the protections and last process. So think about, again, one of the more common ways to use phishing emails is, hey, Charlie, this is your partner. Um, please change my bank routing information because I've changed banks. So that's a traditional phishing uh, type of campaign. Your firewalls and your email filtering may help. Your education, Charlie, may help, but lastly is the process. So Charlie should be trained that you don't change bank routing information based on a single email. So that's kind of how this pieces all fit together. You got to put all these together. They all have to be, if all of them are good, you collectively have a great solution. Anyone's not going to get you where you need to go. Absolutely. And that is so very true. I um, was actually thinking of a story one of my mates told me. Like I said, I worked in IT security for a little while and one of my mates was telling me how um, they had been employed to check the IT security of a system. But they said, well, no, what I'll do is I'll check the security of the system. 
and they managed to get into this um, company, walk in through the door by tailgating employees through the through the gates. They got past the security as a result of that. They got up onto a floor. They had a little card that looks like it was their ID card. They sat at a desk and they took over the server from internally, like they're sitting at the desk taking over the server. And the manager who employed him walked past and went, I'll just keep moving because he knew he worked out what he was doing. But he said it was 20 minutes, 20 minutes and he was in because people didn't follow the process. The guards at the, at the security didn't stop him because he was tailgating and say, can we check your ID? People who didn't recognise him on the floor didn't stop him and say, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, that's just a new contract, but that's what that is. Um, so that, that, you know, that to me really underscored how easy it was. Like this was a and think about it. I'm sorry, absolutely. If you if think about it, if a business owner has a million dollars to spend on cybersecurity and whatever, a thousand dollars, and that all goes to buying a really, really good firewall, a really, really good network protection, that doesn't solve any of the problem you just described. So again, you kind of distribute your efforts and distribute your money across all these things. Go buy, go be pretty good at everything as opposed to being great at any one thing. Now that that's that's a really good piece of advice. Be pretty good. Be good at somewhat good at some things, and yeah, not good at all. Not great at one or one thing. Um, okay, so what sort of things do business owners need to think about? And a lot of my listeners will have remote teams. They will mm -hmm. um, be independent business owners themselves that contract and partner with other independent business owners to provide services to clients clients will be asking them to um check their emails like i want you to manage and check my emails for me i want you to manage my youtube channel i want you to do all these things there's a whole heap of security issues that we need to consider in all of that not and some of that is a liability issue for you as the subcontractor some of it's a liability issue for you as the person doing the employer employing or contracting what do we need to think about <laughs> there's a lot there. there there is a lot to think about i i would suggest a small business owner or leaders in this space start with take some time and really think about how secure do you have to be? You don't need to be Fort Knox. You don't need to be bulletproof. That should not be your goal because you're never going to be bulletproof and you're going to go bankrupt on the journey. You got to be secure enough and take a little bit of time to really think through that. And what you described, Charlie, really are the indicators, the roadmaps to help you understand that. So you're selling to somebody. These days, all the buyers, all your partners have expectations on you, right? So that they're going to say, hey, before I sign a contract, show me you do backup, show me you do multi-factor authentication, whatever. It's typically, the buyers will have some kind of guidance on cybersecurity. Um, you as a business owner, you probably have insurance. You hopefully have some level of cyber insurance. That will also dictate how secure you have to be. There's all sorts of regulations that touch us in one way or another, whether it's medical or financial or credit cards or state or whatever it may be. Um, and there's also expectations for the people you're selling to. If you're selling to the customers, to, to the general public, to business, all these expectations are out there. So, so take a little bit of time and really map out what is that line of security for you. And that would be the, the right place to start. Because, again, we, we talked about the, the, the idea of someone walking through and walking in and, and just hacking the server by walking up to it. If you spend all your money in the wrong spot, you're not going to fix your security problems. So make sure you understand your goal before you really start on the journey. Okay, so um, how, I know you said that there's things about policies that people are going to be wanting. If you're a new business owner starting out, what, sorry, I'm just thinking, because you said something else that I wanted to touch on. So let me just go back to that. You said that you're not going to be 100% bulletproof. Uh, and I think that's actually a really good point for us just to, to dig into a little bit before we go any further. Yeah. I have a lot of people say to me, I want to be 100% safe. I want to be unhackable. My, I want my website to be unhackable. I want to be absolutely secure. And my answer is not going to happen. But why is that not going to happen? Well, 
it, it becomes clear when you kind of reframe the issue. You know, security is not a goal. It's not really objective. Security is a business risk. And just like your HR risk and your competitive risk and your financial risk and the other risks that business owners have to deal with, it's something you manage. You know, if you want your, um, if you want to completely avoid uh, HR risk and maybe you have a sexual harassment policy, you know, how much effort do you put in to make sure those policies are hundred percent protected? You can have an army of HR people in <laughs> monitoring every single conversation, every single email. It's just cost prohibitive to shoot for bulletproof in any area of risk. So in, in the cyberspace, and I, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story, Charlie, in the U S here, I did a series of presentations for small legal practices around the U S and, and most of those are, are governed or part of what they call the American Bar Association. So it's, it's the big legal uh, consortium in the United States. And the American Bar Association had, Association had guidance for these small medical practices, a, a cybersecurity booklet. And I, I read through it and I was going to summarize it for the, for the lawyers I'm talking to. And I'll summarize it for you. It is it was, it was a booklet, read through all of it, all the pretty pictures on the charts and graph, but it really came down to a single bullet point that said, go be pretty good at security and then buy a lot of insurance. That, that was the ex that, Sorry. that was what they said. <laughs> That's awesome. that, that was it. It, it is, and it, it, this is a business risk. If, if you can become really close to bulletproof in cyber, but it's really expensive, it's cost per heavy. Think about the government's not bulletproof. You know, these billion dollar banks are not bulletproof. Don't shoot for bulletproof. Shoot for good, good enough. But and then I'll throw more wrinkle in here, Charlie. What people need to think about is what they call business resiliency. So we're going to deal with 99% of the problems if we go through and we do our basics high, cyber hygiene. And we can explain a little more what that means. Cyber hygiene is just do the basics. Do you patch? Do you have good passwords? Do you have backups? Do the basics will protect you from 99% of the problems that are out there. And then what you do is you plan to make your business resilient against any of these really extraneous cybersecurity attacks. So if China wants to break into your company, they're likely going to get in. It, it just is what it is. How does your business survive? And that really is what business business resiliency is. If, you're, if your servers are offline for a week, how do you satisfy your contracts? If you're down for a week or two, how do you pay your staff? You know, what are the expectations out there? So again, go, go be good at security. And then spend the rest of your time on business resiliency, which is, you know, business continuity planning. It's it's cyber insurance. It's how you deal with the fringe stuff, just like the other insurance that your business has to has to, or should have in place. Yeah, that that's so true. Um, I, I it's just something as simple as make sure you've got backups, <laughs> and make sure you have backups that aren't online that you can take offline that you can put somewhere else. It, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's really, really simple things, but people don't think about it. And sometimes those simple things aren't as simple when you get start to dig down into it. And you're like, oh, well, if that would happen, then this is this is actually a risk to us. But you don't think about it until normally it's happened, and you go, oh, that was a problem. Exactly, and I don't think it's reasonable. I don't think you'd want you'd expect a business leader to be. Um, you know, well versed in cybersecurity. So a business leader yeah. has to understand there's a risk and call upon the right resources to address the risk at a reasonable level. So that, that brings us to the idea of resources. Don't try to articulate your own cybersecurity needs. You know, I've been in the business for a while, you've been in the business well. We can probably come up with a good list of things we should be looking at. Business leaders aren't going to do that. Okay. They don't have the skill set, they don't have the experience because they're they're running their business. They're doing a great job doing that. So I, I would tell you another takeaway for the, for these small business leaders is go find a reasonable frameless framework or checklist that you can use to review your organization. So in the US, uh, the Small Business Administration and the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission, they've got great guidance for small business in the cybersecurity space. And it'll walk you through passwords and backups and agreement with your IT service providers. We talked about that. It talks about insurance. So it, it's it's like, I don't know, 30 or 40 questions to make sure you cover the basics. So go find a good framework that you can trust and you can leverage. That, that would be another great takeaway for business leaders. 
I'm actually pretty certain that business.gov.au, and I will check it and put it into the show notes, pretty certain that there is actually something on the um, Australian government business side of things for that. I know I've seen it. I know I've seen them do a couple of things like that. And then I'll tell you what I would do as a business leader, take that checklist and hand it to your IT service provider. We talked about outsource IT services. Hey, I'm paying you to run my IT shop. Show me that we've addressed everything in this checklist that I provided for you. That, if I haven't, how do we do it? It's, if this, is this something you do? Because if it's not something you do, then we're going to need to bring in another party to help us do it. Exactly, exactly. But 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 then you have the knowledge and, and you've got kind of a standard. Again, the framework is great because someone's really kind of help you understand that the risk profile and the risk of landscape out there and kind of gave you somewhat of a roadmap. So that, that would be a great place to look. You know, another thing we haven't really haven't talked much about, Charlie, I'm assuming a lot of these business owners are using cloud-based services. So your email, maybe maybe your payroll, uh, uh, scheduling, uh, marketing, whatever it may be. There's a lot of cloud-based technologies out there. You know, don't forget as a business leader that you still have a certain level of cybersecurity responsibility in that relationship. So um, in, in the cloud world, AWS will call that shared uh, security model. But the idea is that Microsoft with 365, they take care of backups for you and they take care of power. They take care of physical security and some other things. But you as a business owner, you're responsible for people and for training and for passwords and for processes and all those sorts and access rights, those sorts of things. So keep in mind, even if you're using a service, you still have to kind of keep an eye on what's going off, going on in the Microsoft space or the QuickBooks or your ERP, whatever it may be. Absolutely. Now we were speaking, you spoke a little bit there about per, per, per persons, peoples, and um, you mentioned earlier, you know, that the phishing, the phishing one is just a classic. Uh, one example I can give on that is one organisation I know in the US, actually their IT person actually sends out emails to everyone in the company from fake email addresses saying, hey, can you send me a $25 gift card? <laughs> Uh, because the the idea is to see who is following processes and who's not following processes mm-hmm. and what I reckon they, I reckon they get like a ten percent response rate on that, which is horrifying. Um, but yeah, you know, and and they and that, that just highlights to them where they've got problems that they've got to sort out. And I think that's a great way of doing it. But we don't. One of the things that people don't realise still is that no matter how good your IT is you're still going to get people ringing you up saying, hey, tell me about this thing. Like um, they might ring, they might actually get onto your virtual assistant. And I'm going to go back to another example, but they might get onto your virtual assistant and say, oh, hi, look, this is so-and-so. Do you think you could reset my password for me? Or I own this hosting account. Can you give me my login details? They're going to bypass all of your IT security. They're going to bypass all of your online stuff. And they're going to go straight to a person. And what can happen in those cases? That, 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 that's a great question. Uh, you know, the good news is as a really small shop, if you're two, three, four person shop, you may well know each other very well. But once you start going one level beyond that, you don't really know. Um, plus, not to get really scary, but there's a lot of great deep fake technology out there. And that's the idea that um, you know, I can send you a message that sounds like it's from you know, U.S. centric here, but Joe Biden and the, the voice will be exactly like Joe Biden. Um, so if someone were to call the help desk pretending to be whomever, the voice can be spoofed so easily these days by artificial intelligence. Um, there was actually a story, Charlie, a few weeks ago, a company, maybe a couple of months ago, a company out of China where they misdirected twenty five million dollars just went out the door. And what happened is that someone in the finance got it an email saying, hey, this is the president of the company, you know, spoofed email. Uh, we need to send $25 million to his bank account. And the guy stopped, said, hey, this is odd. This doesn't follow my process. And that's great. Good, good one point for him. But the bad guys followed up with a Zoom link, a, a video link. And the guy joined the video link. And on the video link was the CEO, the CFO, and one other executive. And they were all deep fake videos. And they chatted and they convinced the guy to send $25 million right out the door. 
So, you know, being able to authenticate people is very hard these days. You, you can't trust voice, you can't trust video, you can't trust emails anymore. So think through your processes really quick. You know, how do you authenticate people? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and this is one reason why two-factor authentication to me is a good good way of doing it. Um, the other one that I've had is I need an email address that you have that I have on file and I need a code that you've given me. I need some passphrase or something that you personally have given me that I can then verify you against because it happens. <laughs> it happens with way too much regularity for my liking. It, it does, but you know, if the bad guys get inside your email, they, a, account takeover is one of the objectives. They get an email, all of a sudden they have full access to Terry's email. If the previous emails had some kind of code, the bad guys have the code. Um, or if the bad guys get into the other party's email, they have the code from the sender. So that, that that's why you want kind of out of band authentication. Okay. The idea if if emails totally hose and the bad guys have total control of the email, it should be an email and a phone call or or something else. Yep. So two factor two bands. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, which is why, you know, and I, I know I, I a number of my listeners are my clients and they've come to me and they've said, Oh, um, we need access to the host. I'm like, and like it, they'll come on a chat and I'll go, okay, cool. I need you to verify who you are because I can't trust that you are this person. They're like, oh, so I'm going to give you a call. Okay. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> yeah. what else are you going to do? And it, it sounds stupid and it sounds paranoid, but um, it is that it, it really is that easy. Yeah, and it's the expectations. You as a business owner have a certain liability. If, if you misdirect a payment because you accepted an email request to change the payment information, who's responsible for that? Who, who, who's at fault in that case? You know, they, these are all just becoming table stakes, just basic expectations for, for you know business practice these days. So there's a certain level of liability to this as well. I just got a message saying that I didn't have any sound. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Hmm? Stupid computers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is this is the uh, this is the tech person going stupid computers. <laughs> um, maybe okay, you've been so, hacked, Charlie. You've been hacked. Oh, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm a deep fake. Oh, that would be so nice having a deep fake <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to sort of hit on, uh, people have heard the term uh, crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside, and, um, you know, it, and I, I also like your analogy, you know, you, it, you've got to make it good enough. One of the things I work on when we're working, particularly in the IT security and making sure that hosting, hosting services are, are secure and that websites are secure is that, they're just that too much difficult to hack that someone's going to go elsewhere and not try someone else because yours is just too much dif too difficult to do um is that still a valid strategy to use uh, i i don't know because right now attacks are all automated and and things just run basically the bad guys turn the switch on and it, it, it'll look unless you're specifically targeted again unless china or some specific company or someone's targeting charlie um really what you as a business owner have to deal with again is the 99 percent of the problems so you got to make sure you're patched you got to make sure you have multi-factor oh, yeah. authentication you got to make sure your remote access is secure so to me there, there's some fringe stuff that until you get the 99 percent fixed i wouldn't even worry about the one percent on the outside of your bell curve deal with the things that the, the basic hygiene that the checklist that you and i talked about leverage the checklist and make sure you have the basics in place that that's where you got to put your money and your effort so let's say, let's actually have a quick chat about that hygiene because i know you've, you've touched on it a couple of times um patches is the big one for me patches is the big one because mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do for a lot of clients but what else do we need and when, when we say patch talking about and what other things do we need to be considering yeah, so patching the idea is, is the, there, there's always holes and and, and and vulnerabilities and gaps that are covered in different systems and, and patching is the way that Microsoft ever fixes it and, and deploys it, uh, a, a corrective piece of software, the patch that you need to deploy. Um, as soon as the patch is released, 
the bad guys grab the patch and they decompile it and then they can exploit the hole the patch is designed to fix. So that's why you got to be quick to put the patches on when they're released. Everything you have, you know, unless you're a, a fringe case, automatically install all patches immediately. All of your stuff has to has to do that. And, and I would go a little deeper in that uh, topic there, Charlie. I think a lot of businesses, small or large, struggle with basic inventory. You know, do you really understand where all of your things are? Servers, backups, tapes, phones, laptops. So your physical access. Do you know where your data is? Do we have spreadsheets in Google and Dropbox on a thumb drive and a phone? Where, where's your data at? Who are your partners and your contracts? You know, do you really know who your people are? including, you know, maybe have some trainees and contractors and vendors and partners. So the basic inventory, I think, is, is really necessary to make everything work because you can't patch unless you know all your stuff. You can't train unless you're really 100% sure who all your people are. You can't meet your contractual obligations unless you really understand your contract. So that foundational inventory, I'd, I'd consider that even step one of a hygiene. Know your stuff before you can fix and correct all your stuff. Okay, and that that includes, you know, if you've got different accounts in different different systems, knowing where your passwords are, knowing what your usernames and passwords are, um, knowing even knowing who your provider is, because some people say, oh, I don't know, I just log in. Like, well, who's your provider? Oh, I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> well now we have to go find that out. Um, so yeah. so. Wait, so when we're talking patches, and I, I I really wanted to just come back on that one. Mm -hmm. As soon as the patch comes out, people are actually taking that code and decompiling it and finding out what the what the problems are, uh, and then they just start exploiting it. it. It's easy enough for them to find out who's running that old patch um, or patch mm -hmm. software that's older. There is, they now have a consolidated list mm -hmm. of exploits they can use. And when when Terry was talking about automating attacks that's exactly what they do uh, they can they can grab a server somewhere in the world i think it costs oh, it costs less than 100 bucks an hour <laughs> and they just run a script on it that goes try this ip address try this ip address. try it try it try it. oh we've got one here now let's see how we how far in we can get um it's quite horrifying it's quite inexpensive and it's quite effective if you aren't patching if you are patching it is less of a risk. I'm not going to say you're going to be 100% secure, but you've got less chance of getting hacked by something that's been out in the in in, uh, in the in the wild for a longer period. Um, yeah, I think that's also in the patching space. That would be a great place to build a few metrics for your security program. Again, I know we're talking about really small shops, but if you're paying someone to manage your IT. I would expect they can give you a list of how many patches you're missing and how old are they. And, and, and that the, the age of the patch is the critical thing. If you have critical patches that are more than a couple of days old, you got a problem. So th those are some kind of real foundational metrics that you can hold your security team accountable for, whether it's, it's Charlie or an IT provider, whomever. B basic metrics of all critical patches will be deployed within three days and, and hold them accountable as numbers and may, make them show them to you. That's a really great idea. Absolutely. I know that um, I run a number yeah. of servers for people and I'm pretty much in there every day or my team's pretty much in there every day applying patches to the servers because they come out pretty much every day. <laughs> There's something else yeah. that we've got to deal with. Um, now, if, if we can just sort of hit on that a little bit further, what is meant by the term zero day exploit? Because people see that come up and I'm not sure they actually understand what it means. Yes, yeah, so zero day is it, it, talking about how quickly the bad guys are ahead of the fix. So again, if we decide that there's a hole in Windows 11, Windows 11 out there, um, the bad guys know it before Microsoft has a patch. That would be zero day because it's not fixable. Um, you know, once the patch is released, in theory, you can't exploit the hole anymore once, once they get patched. But but the, the zero days basically the bad guys are ahead of the good guys, and and you're you're in a lot of trouble at that point. Yeah. Um, and again, that that's the day we talked um, about the, the the multiple layers of cybersecurity, what we call defense in depth. 
So there may be some cases where the bad guys know issues that, for example, Microsoft hasn't fixed yet. What do you do in that case? Again, if you put all of your effort into patching, you're going to be in trouble because sometimes that's not going to work. So can you detect when a bad guy tries to get in? If something happens, can you respond correctly? Do you have like antivirus? Do you have a, um, a MDR sort of solutions? There's cool tools you can put on that when the bad guys exploit, you can try to stop them. How well do your backups work? Can you put your backups back in? So again, a good reminder, don't put all your eggs in, in the vulnerability management bucket because it's not always going to work. You, you want patching at 99% and then spend your resources elsewhere. Yep. Absolutely. And I mean, you said patching at 99%. I know that um, a lot of people are still very iffy about doing their Windows patches. Um, yeah, a lot of us have been around long enough that we, we remember when a patch would come down and your computer would be offline for two days while you rebuilt the operating system because the patch was that bad. Um, that's not so much the case now. <laughs> and and really, yeah. you should be applying at least the critical security patches as soon as they come down the line. Well, it's also a good, good point we can talk about is, is the idea of risk. Um, if you have a public facing server, if you have a server which hosts websites, for example, or you have a server that, that hosts email, so it's available on the internet to be utilized, that one has to be patched literally within hours. If it's Terry's laptop that's behind it, maybe you can wait a day or two. So, so kind of figure out what's the most important to you. It doesn't have to be patched within an hour, uh, but you certainly shouldn't wait to patch the public facing stuff at, until after you patch everything else. So you understand the criticality to it. it. It doesn't always have to be, not, not everything's equally important, let's put it that way. Awesome. Yeah, look, that's really great. That's really, really great information, Terry. Thank you. Now, what is it you do with businesses now? I mean, you said you consult. Uh, do you work with small business? Do you work with big business? What is it that you're actually doing now? Yeah, I'm working for working with small, mid-sized businesses. And, and what I do is I, I kind of play that exec cyber executive role. So, um, you know, in, in the fractional space where it's, it's, it's a slice of me for multiple clients. And, and I, I help them through a lot of what we spoke about. What's the right level of security? You know, do we need to be Fort Knox? You know, wh where do we need to be in the scale of, of, of security? Uh, do we understand our regulatory and our contractual obligations? Um, you know, things like if we have a cyber program for backups, have we tested the backup? So I, I, I map out programs and roadmaps and, and then work with the right people to do it, which is why I can be in there fractionally for, you know, a, a day or two a month and then work with IT service providers, with, with developers, with part, whoever it may be to do the legwork. But um, I'll set and oversee the program to meet what the business needs to do in the security space. Fantastic. Look, that sounds that sounds great. That sounds really exciting to me and really interesting. I know some people will be going, oh, my God, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> but that sounds really exciting to me. Um, so how do people get in touch with you? That, that, I think that's a really good, I think it's a good place to ask that question at the moment. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I work for as a partner of a company called Tech CXO out of the U.S. here. So we, we work with clients all well, over the U.S. and across the world. Um, but we're a collection of fractional executives. So, you know, a lot of senior folks, we all have what they call C-suite, you know, chief executive or chief positions in, in companies. Um, so part of a collective, you know, for me, it helps out because then I can leverage uh, other partners. I, I was an independent guy, Charlie, for many years uh, working as a fractional, but it also mean then that um, I'm doing policy work and I'm doing testing work and other work that probably is better suited for someone that's a more experienced and b maybe a little cheaper than I am. Uh, so the advantage of working with a bigger fractional organization, I've got, I've got staff available to me. But um, yeah, I, I'm at Tech CXOs if you're looking for me. Excellent. Look, I'm going to put that into the um, show notes. Are you also on LinkedIn? I am. I am. Yep. Terry Zimniak. Excellent. You can find me a tough, awesome. tough last name, but I'm assuming we'll have a link. 
I will. I'm sure I will put it into the show notes. How's that? Now, now I just wanted to remind people that I do have my locals community. Ask Charlie Latham. Locals.com. Being a business owner can be tough. It can be lonely, and it can be frustrating because we work remotely. We work on our own, typically, in the space that I'm talking to. That's why I started this community. It's for business owners that can be a little bit like the water cooler of old. The sort of stuff that we're talking here today about not the nitty-gritty stuff but the oh I'm really having trouble with this what do you reckon where should I go how should I do it that's what I want the community to be for so I want you to treat that community as a place where you not only get to interact with me but with each other you can gain inspiration provide it uh, ask for advice give advice join in discussions sometimes just even have a little rant if you want to so come across and join me at ask charlieleatham.locals.com now back to us um what are do, do you have a couple of things that business owners could leave here this this discussion today and start to act on yeah, I think we, we've spoken about a few of them, but maybe something we haven't touched on is um, pretty much every service that you use, again, Microsoft, uh, Google, LinkedIn, we talked about, uh, your, your cloud-based ERP, all, all these cloud-based tools, you as a business leader, you as a user have a certain level of uh, responsibility in the security space. Again, you're not patching, which is great. You're not backing up, which is great but you're responsible for the accounts, the access rights, things like that. Take time A to inventory. And we talked about that problem there, Charlie. Make sure you know what, what cloud tools you're using. But then for each of them, just quickly Google um, security, best practice security for Google Workspace. And Google has a great one pager. Here's your guidance. If you're a small business owner of the Google Workspace, this is how you protect your email. This is how you protect your accounts. This is how you protect your password. LinkedIn has one, uh, Twitter has one. So go on there and say, I want to protect my Twitter, oh, sorry, X, <laughs> it's called X now. I want to protect my X account and it'll talk about turning on your multi-factor. It'll say maybe, um, and a LinkedIn, for example, make sure you have two administrators. What, what, what if Charlie's on vacation, who, who's there to do the administrative work? Um, so all of these cloud solutions that best practice, go take a minute, look them up and, and review those and, and you know take care of those risks that are out there. Look, that's, that is fantastic, and that's probably something I'm actually going to end up putting a little list together, not only for myself, but for my own clients to look at. Uh, so let's just sort of recap some of that. Some, we've got to do an inventory of our systems uh, and our hardware and our software, know what we've got, know where it is, know who's got it pretty much, so that when you need to go and look at it, you can find it to begin with. Um hygiene your your what did, did you call that digital hygiene is that what you're calling it cyber hygiene cyber, cyber hygiene. hygiene cyber hygiene i love that term um yeah, make yeah. sure that you're keeping your software and your patches up to date uh yeah even sometimes your hardware needs a bit of an update occasionally mm -hmm. um make sure you've got processes and policies in place that help your people be secure and there are other tools like two factor we've we've spoken about them we haven't gone into any depth on them but two factor authentication um what were some of the others terry well there's a lot out there uh the, the basic ones patching your backups make sure your backups work <laughs> make sure your backups back up what you think they're backing up and make sure you can put it all back together so uh, that's also a good reminder that just because you've checked the box doesn't necessarily mean you're secure. So, um, you know, if you, you got backups, great. Do they work? Can you put all back together? Um, good passwords are in place, but is then it, do you have good passwords for everybody or just some people? Um, but it, we can come up with a list, but honestly, Charlie, I'd recommend going again, finding a good checklist that Let's the see our last one. That was it. there's a lot of good things out there so that they'll kind of walk you through these key steps. Um, awesome. I think another thing we really talk about, Charlie, which, which I would really recommend, whether you're a small business or big, if we realize we have a finite amount of resources and we have finite staff and finite attention, frankly, to spend in the cyberspace, make sure you're dealing with the problems that, that can impact you. So that, that's what they call threat analysis. So go Google 
top cyber threats small business. And, and those are the things you should be looking to address. And they're going to talk about a lot of things you and I chatted about, phishing, passwords, and I like lost laptops are going to pop up there. Go figure out what the top risks are for small businesses, maybe even in your industry. And, and, and that becomes what you use to build out your roadmap. Maybe each month you focus on one of those risks and you move that forward, but spend your time in the right spots. Okay, so let's, yeah, that, that is really, really, really good advice. Um, you've only got a finite budget. Uh, you aren't ever going to have enough money, enough time, enough people to address every little thing that, that I'm not even going to say you need to address, that every little thing that people are saying you should address. Um, and as I say with most things, it's what's going to give you the most bang for your buck. When it comes down to it, what's going to give you the most protection for the most cost-effective approach that you can take? So get your go get your government checklist, go and do that Google about top cyber security issues for your industry or for small business and start to put it together. And if you want a hand, reach out. I'm sure I'm sure Terry would love to hear from you. Um and you know. Drop some comments, let us know, and we'll see how we can help you out. So is there, is there any one thing, apart from everything else you've spoken about, that you want people to go away with from today, Terry? I think you've covered the basics. I realize that that it's a journey. You know, it's not a destination. If you are really secure today, you may have to reconsider tomorrow because tomorrow there's – your business changes, you hire people, you have new partners, maybe there's new cyber threats on the back end. So realize it's a journey, uh, be comfortable with, with the idea that you're gonna, you wanna, be, you wanna be pretty secure, but not bulletproof. And then don't forget about worst case scenario, make sure your insurance is in place, make sure you know your business resiliency concepts, how do you survive if all of your servers are gone? Um, so, you know, with the right mindset, don't panic, have a plan, um, get, 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 get to a good space and, and then manage your, the, the real fringe, unlikely scenarios that may put you out of business. Awesome. Look, Terry, thank you so much for spending the time with us this afternoon. I really do appreciate oh, this afternoon. This, it's this morning for me. It's the evening for you. Let's just get today. <laughs> Agreed. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure, Charlie. Thank you for your time. I have really appreciated it. Guys, please remember to, let me see if I get this right, like this video, subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell so you find out when you get when we drop more content. Go and visit Terry, um, connect with him, have a look at what he's got to offer because I think it's going to be beneficial for you. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, guys. Bye.